Hello, uh, welcome everyone. My name is Juanpe. I'm a freelance developer and consultant based here in Berlin. Since I've been living here since six, uh, six years ago, uh, so I'm very happy to be part of the home team today. <laughs> and um, I'm going to talk today about the most valuable values, and values here not as in ethics or as in economic value, which could be two very interesting topics also for a C++ conference, why not? But as in the typical value semantic sense. So the first part of this talk is going to focus on the notion of value semantics. And the value semantics, I would like to, to start in an abstract sense, not talking even very, in a very detailed way about programming or about C++ programming, but value semantics in general. And Value semantics. There are two words here. The second word is semantics, meaning meaning. So basically, when we're talking about value semantics, it means about being able to attribute meaning to our programs, to our code, in a way that uh, is based on values. Right? And what are values? Let's start by giving some examples. The number 42 is a value. The color blue could be a value. The name Juan P. Bolivar could be a value. The function x to x to the fourth power. Hmm. This could be a value, why not? But it's a very interesting value because it introduces a few notions about values. It introduces a name, the name x, um, that is going to refer to a value that is unknown. And it's going to define the name f, in this case, which is another value that is associated to a relationship. Relationships are how we know things about values. Some values are in relationships to each other. And the relationships themselves can be values. Why not? In this case, it's a function, which is a specific case of relationship or a specific kind of relationship. And we uh, can think of it, why not, in terms of values. The set of all natural uh, numbers. Why not? It can be a value. Many of you will think, oh, if I pass that by value in C++, it's going to explode my memory. Well, first, it depends. You're thinking in C++, don't think in C++ first. And second, why do you need to put all the numbers from the set to represent it, right? Here I'm representing it with just one character. The value, it's about the relationships, what we know about it because of its relationships to other things. Finally, it's important in this slide to know what are you looking at here? Are you looking at values? If we're very strict about the words, you're not looking at values. You're looking at representations of values. Sequences of bits, they are representations of values. Characters in a slide, projected in a screen, the representations of values. The values themselves, they're in your head. It's what you think about when you see these things. These things are actually relatively ambiguous, so there could be potentially different values in the different heads of the people in the audience here. So that's why I think it's useful. Uh, it's a useful metaphor to think about the myth of the cave, which was this story that Plato, the philosopher, used to tell his disciples, where he said that we are like the people in the bottom right of the screen here, People that are slaves, enchained, inside a cave, with a wall behind us that stops us from seeing the world for how it is, such that we could only see the world through shadows, shadows that are projected uh, fr uh, via the light, sorry, via the light that comes from above the wall. The shadows is the real world, it's the representations, right? We see these things, but these things are not really what we want to think about. Plato believed that there is this thing he called ideas, and I'm going to associate the Platonic notion of idea to what we think about values when we program, um, that are more pure, more essential, and when you think in term of terms of ideas, you become enlightened and a philosopher, and you reach truth, and yada, yada, yada. Once we think in terms of this, though, we can look at this specific value I showed here. That's my name. I put quotes explicitly because the name is clearly a value, right? A string of characters. Even if we think in terms of programming, it's easy to think about it in terms of values. But what about me? 
am I a value? Well, if we use the platonic idea definition of value, values will be abstract, they will be immaterial, they will be also necessary in the philosophical sense, there is no prior condition for, for, for them to exist, they were somehow in our minds even before we thought of them. They are eternal in this sense, right? They are never created or destructed. The number 42, when was it born? Who cares? It was never born, right? And they are immutable, they don't change. The number 42 is the number 42. You can have the number 42 plus one, which is gonna be a different idea. You can have different values, different ideas that relate to each other, but you can never change uh, one idea itself. I am clearly not like that, right? Like, I'm concrete, I exist in the material world, I'm composed of atoms, I'm not in someone's head, I'm first here before I'm in your head. I'm contingent in the philosophical sense, right? My existence depends on many things like generations and generations of people having sex at the right time in the right moment. I am temporary, so I was born at some point, I will be dead at some point, and I'm mutable. Right? I change every second, I change my mind, I change physically, I change position from one side of this stage to the other. So I'm clearly not a value or an idea in some, in some fundamental way. I'm gonna just name these things that exist in the real world things, right? And before people accuse me of Platonist, I want to say that from an epistemological point of view, I think actually Plato was wrong. Plato said that ideas are more real than real things, right, than representations. I would argue that it's the other way around, right? In the end, we could say what we know from other science now is that ideas and all this stuff that happens in our brain is just, you know, neurons in some configurations, which are other also representations, right? But still, this notion of idea that I'm associating with values here, I think it's useful. It's a useful metaphor to think about the way we think, and it's useful because it allows us first to reason, right? It allows us to think because it would be impossible to think about things if I could not detach them from their physical existence, right? I can, for example, close my eyes and still think about the fact that I'm in a stage, right? Even though I'm not seeing the stage itself. Um, and this allows us to, using this very basic mechanism, build towers of abstractions where at every level we forget about the underlying layer. And this forgetting, it's useful. There are less things we, can take, we have to take into account. It's more manageable for us. So, okay, we've talked about values and things. Things are real, values are in our heads, but how do we get then from things to values? And there are many ways, actually, we can represent, or sorry, we can abstract or think about things in terms of values. One is we can consider the value of all the existence of a thing, right? So we can say someone's life. And someone's life is an idea that encompasses all the states of this person through their whole life. You can even imagine having a super camera that can record one person's life for all their life or something like this. Or you can also, you know, even in a more abstract way, without representing atoms, think about a person's life and make relationships with them. It's tricky though, because for example, for people that are alive, this value also includes things that we don't know about yet because they happen in the future. So very often, especially in computers, we think of the value of a thing in a given state. So we take this movie of a person's life, and we take a snapshot, and we say this is a state, and this is a value that we're gonna then represent in the computer somehow, and establish relationships about it. There is a problem though with this approach, which is that these states, there are many of them that are related to the thing, Many of them are potentially not equal in the mathematical sense, right? We still have to relate them to this thing they belong to. And for that, we can use values of identities. The value of identity is a value that identifies 
right, in a <laughs> mostly tautological sense, identifies a thing, for example, a person, such that we can then say these different states relate to this thing. It allows us to track things in time. So there are many different identities we can use, right? Like, we often think identities, there's only one possible identity, and that's not true, right? If we look at the real world, I can have, I have the identity card from the Spanish state uh, that identifies me among all Spanish citizens. But identities are contextual, right? In this room, probably nobody will approach me by saying my identity card num number. They will just use my name, because nobody else in this room probably has the same name. Also, if you're making a web service, maybe you're not uh, caring so much about the relationship one-to-one -one between people and accounts, so you can use, let's say, an email address as a proxy of identity. Or sometimes you may not find an identity in general that you can use that appears naturally in the essence of the thing, but in a program, you can generate one by using, for example, what's called uh, universally unique identifiers. You can search this on Wikipedia and see how you can generate a number uh, for a thing that is going to be globally unique among everything in the world. And this is very used in distributed systems, but it can also be used in uh, you know, single-threaded programs uh, very effectively. So we know about values now, values that are in our head, values that are in the world, uh, sorry, or things that are in the world that we think about in values, but one of the main ways we have to develop values is by ex exchanging them between people and between people and machines, which is what we're interested in here. So for that, we use language. So we represent values and these relationships in language. And if we're programming, we could think of a language where I can directly give names to values. So we can think of a language where I can say, let x be 42. And in this scope, this name is going to be associated to this value. Or to, this, to a relationship between the name, the value named by x uh, plus 2, or a collection, or a function, or an application of this function through a higher order function, all these things. This language exists, it's called Haskell, and I will say this is one of the most value semantic languages you can have, because the only thing you can give a name to in this language is a value. But there are other languages. This is probably familiar. It could be C or C++, the topic of this conference. And C++ is not so value semantic under the hood. When I give a name to something in C++, I'm not giving a name to a value. I'm giving a name to something in the memory. So if this grid is my memory, what the semantics according to the standard of what the statement int foo equals 42 is, is the runtime is going to allocate an object for you in a place called stack probably, but we don't care. It's going to allocate a region in this memory. And in this particular case, we're also initializing it. So it's associating the name to that. And then it's going to store the value inside that location. But the name is not associated to the value. The name is associated to the location, which incidentally happens to have the value. And these locations, they are a little bit like things, right? Because I can take the pointer of a location, which is its identity, actually. And then I can use these to describe changes in this location, right? So I can say, please, in the next, when you execute the next sentence, um, you know, change the value of the location. Actually, I'm doing it through this indirect name, which is using the identity value, this is the pointer, uh, to get to the location and change it, right? So we have to think about objects when we uh, use C++. And objects are just this, right? A location in memory plus a type, which determines how big the location is and what kind of operations is the compiler allow you to apply uh, on this location, plus a lifetime. And this is very important. In this case, I'm using a local variable. So C++ developers know this means the object associated to the name has automatic allocation and automatic deallocation at the end of the scope. 
That also means to create dynamic, uh, dynamically allocated objects. But the notion of lifetime is also very interesting with regards to identities, right? Because as I said before, identities are contextual. You have to think of identity among the set of things that this identity allows you to distinguish the object. A pointer allows us to distinguish an alive object from every other alive object, but it does not allow us to distinguish it from objects that have been there before or after, right? And this is why we have problems in C++ like dangling pointers. <coughs> so in C++, we can only name objects, and this is a power because we can talk low level to the machine and do things very efficiently, but it's also a limitation. And as Wittgenstein said, the limits of my language means the limit of my world. And very often C++ programmers fall for something I will describe as object fetishism. And I think I've been an object fetishist for most of my life, and that's why I would like to share how I think about programming now here, which I will define as when all you can name is an object, everything looks like an object, right? In C++, we tend to model the world in terms of objects, even in cases where it's not necessary. And I'm going to give you some examples. Let's say I'm trying to build a database of people where I have persons that have a name, an email, a phone, and a year, a birth year, and then I have a vector of these people. Um, first, this I'm not going to focus in this talk about types, so don't blame me for using strings for describing the names and an email and a phone. You could use more strict types and all this stuff. But this talk is more about values, so we're going to focus about values here. This is very value semantic, right? In the traditional C++ intuition, like I can copy it and all this stuff. This is perfect. Now, let's say I want to add a new feature to this um, program that is using this uh, data model. Uh, which is people can have friends, right? So since people can have friends, I'm going to just add, let's say, a vector of pointers to people in a person, right? So a person can declare what their friends are. This doesn't establish the invariant of the reciprocity of friendship, but that's okay for now. Uh, there is a problem here, though, right? So many C++ programmers already know that a vector does not guarantee a stable identities for the elements it contains. So, uh, you know, these pointers that I'm storing here, they're going to be invalidated as soon as I do things with the vector of people. So we can change it. We can store things instead in the heap, in dynamically allocated memory. So we manage things in a little bit more manually, so we ensure the location stays the same for a person's lifetime in our database. This is a problem still because these pointers can become dangling when I remove the people from the database. So I can, for example, use a share pointer in the vector and then a weak pointer in the other vector. So at least I can notice, you know, the weak pointer has become null or something. Now, what is the problem with this? Well, as most millennial, I have lots of identity problems, but I can tell you one thing I am sure I'm not. I am not a pointer. Why do you say I am a pointer in this vector of friends? Why don't you give me a proper identity? Give me an identity, and then everything else will become much simpler. You can just have a vector of normal people. Just choose whatever way you want to store your data, because it doesn't matter to me anymore where the object is, right? Now I'm moving to more value semantics. So yes, I can have a vector of identities, and I can be more playful also with the data structures, right? So if I want to have you know, an easier way to access, I can have a set of friends as opposed to a vector, and a map of identities to people to store the database, or maybe I could move the friendships to add the res reciprocity. <laughs> Uh, as a boost multi-index with you know, some parameters so I can do queries fast and all this stuff. I can be more playful with the data structures just because 
I separated myself from the notion of object, right? I can understand the, pro the program uh, just by thinking about values. So I think what this shows also is that reference semantics and value semantics, they're not really a, a just a no question. We have lots of tools in the language C++ that push us in one direction or in the other direction, right? The good news is that we can always move actually in both directions, but we can always move in the direction from reference semantics to value semantics via the tool of abstraction. I'm going to show you a few examples of that. Let's say this function. Is the pushback function in a vector value semantic? I mean, we think normally the vectors are value semantic because they have a copy constructor and copy assignment and all this stuff. But the vector function, I mean, I really have to think about which object am I applying the function to, right? This is mutating the vector in place. So I have to be careful, for example, that I don't have pointers, or um, not even pointers, just iterators looking inside the vector when I do this, right? Because they're going to be invalidated. So actually, I would say this function, like most functions, or almost every function that actually does mutation in place, um, has reference semantics to some degree. But that's no problem, because I can use abstraction. And the basic tool for abstraction is functions plus the tool that C++ gives us, passing by value and returning by value, to make a value semantic wrapper for this otherwise reference semantic method, right? Another way we can uh, move from uh, reference semantics to value semantics. Here I have a class that has a shared pointer to something, something actually I call here impl. Is this reference semantics or value semantics? Well, a share pointer I had listed in the reference semantic part of things, but I'm going to say it depends. And it depends on what the interface of this class is. If everything in this class is const, this could be value semantic. Because it's shared mutable state that causes us to think in reference terms. Sharing state that is not mutable is fine, right? I'm just sharing a representation for a value, but I'm still thinking of the value because it's not going to go away at any time. So I can add a way to change, to update this data structure, or, or this type, that instead of mutating the thing in place, it's going to be a const method that returns a new version of the thing when it wants to be updated. This, though, it can be implemented in terms of mutation. So it's going to clone the pointer, it's going to use mutation in place, and then it's going to return the new version, right? This is another example of abstracting, going from mutation to uh, immutability. And in C++11, we got this great feature called uh, R-value references, which allow us to do uh, something that in the academic world is called uh, affine types. But basically, uh, what an R-value reference is saying is this is uh, the only name or the only reference to this object in the program, right? And this allows us to make assumptions, because if it's the only reference, we know the effects, the modifications to the object, they are not going to be seen outside of this function. Because I put this double ampersand, ampersand here, this is going to be, this function call is going to be only uh, picked when you use a temporary value, the method on a temporary value or a moved from value, which means, yeah, here you can make assumptions that, okay, I am the only person looking at this particular instance of foo. So then I can check, am I also, uh, am I this instance of foo, the only reference to the object that is contained in the shared pointer? In that case, I know the effects, the modifications to these things cannot be seen by anyone at all. So I can just mutate it in place. Otherwise, I have to uh, do the copy version of things. So this means actually that if you, you know, linearly change, 
your modified calls, you're going to get the performance you will get with an otherwise mutable API, actually, while still thinking in the text of your program in value ways. One disclaimer, the unique methods, which is actually deprecated in shared pointer, is not thread safe, so don't do these things this way. It's very easy to make it thread safe, so you can just use another implementation of shared pointer. You know, it's always with C++, it's like almost there, but then you have to put a warning in your slide. Um, but I think the general pattern is valid, and, and I use it in a library I implemented of immutable data structures that I'm not going to talk a lot today, but uh, this is the technique upon which you build these abstractions. Um, another way to abstract things. Let's say I have a class that represents my screen. Now it's getting complicated, right? Because this represents something like, let's say, this screen here. I cannot duplicate it, right? It, it's just there in the, in the world. I, have, I know about it through an identity, like the screen handle that the operating system gave me, and that's it, right? So I'm going to probably make this class non-copyable, maybe movable, though. Um, what can I do? Well, the first thing we can do is to, again, use the trick of relying on move semantics. I can say, well, I can give you a new value for the screen as long as you're done with the old value, right? Because I'm going to destroy the old value in the process of creating the new one. And I think this is an interesting way to look at it, but it might be sometimes non-satisfactory, right? Because some people might argue this is just changing the syntax. In the end, it's the same process as with mutation. Another way to do things, though, could be to say, well, I have a draw function that allows me to build a specification of how I want to do, draw things, but doesn't draw them directly. And this is really a value, right? This is a specification. And this is specification could even be just a function. So here I'm just returning a function that is evaluated in some context. And this context is probably be hidden in some part of my program, hard to create, such that most users just create the specifications as opposed to evaluating them. And in this way, I can have, yeah, part of my code that builds a specification to how to draw things, and then another part that does this side effects. This is another way to think about things in values. And this notion of adding a specification language is very used in the web technology space these days, actually. So imagine you have a document, an HTML document, and you're writing JavaScript. You have a mutable API for mutating this document, but you don't want to use it, right? Because you're a functional programmer, you want to use value semantics, not object fetishes tools. So you have this very nice, small value-based representation of your document. Then an event happens, and you're going to have a pure function that returns another version of the document uh, with the change incorporated with some small changes in it, but a very similar structure. What people in the web has found out that you can still use this abstract, abstract, uh, sorry, as an abstraction on top of a mutable API when you use a different algorithm that then evaluates what changed between these two snapshots of the world and then produces the actual changes into the mutable thing, right? This is what is called, uh, or is the fundamental mechanism behind React.js that many of you might know. Uh, it's an extremely popular framework uh, from the for web development and that I really wish uh, someone did something, at least in spirit, similar to this uh, for C++ at some point. So this pushes us to the question, when to use value semantics? The question from our first slide, where are values most valuable? And I've changed in my thinking about this a lot. When I started programming C++, I used to think that values are useful for micro design. And I used to think this because it's easier, right? Like ints are values and vectors are values, so it's easy to write a small function that is very value semantic inside, and you can use range v3, you know, and we all know no for loops and all these little tools to do small value thingies. But when you think about the system as a whole, then you start thinking, okay, in protocols and in objects in the end that talk to each other to 
tell them, tell each other to do things. Do this, do that. But I've changed my mind. I think objects are fine in micro design because it's micro, it's small. The damage they can do is contained, right? Values are a tool for thinking. And in this case, we don't have many things, so we can still think about the thing even though it does mutation. However, when it gets to macro design, when it gets to architecture, we have now lots of components. Now we need abstraction. And as we've seen in the previous slides, we have tools for abstraction, actually, that allow us to, as we move up in our system, uh, we can move to value thinking. So this leads us to the second part of the talk, where I'm going to exercise this way of thinking, uh, proposing a value-based architecture for interactive software. Actually, inter interactive software is interesting, right? Because it seems like for the last 30 years, it hasn't changed much how we do, how we write interactive software, especially in the C++ world. And we don't even talk about it much, in spite of the fact that I think a lot of the most important C++ pieces of software are uh, interactive software, like uh, Adobe Photoshop, or uh, Microsoft Excel, or Ableton Live, or you know all these tools that allow you to create things. But our industry is kind of moving towards uh, I don't know, more solving, solving the problem of delivering things uh, via the internet for consumption or something. Anyways, um, this is how we've built uh, interactive software for a while, and it kind of works, but it doesn't scale very well. We have a model, we have a view, and we have controllers, and all these things, they are objects, right? Somehow. So the strong arrows, they are references. The view knows about the model, and it's going to do things to it. The controller probably knows about the model, and it's going to do things to it. And then the model has dash arrows to the other two, because it doesn't know about them directly, but it's going to keep a reference to them indirectly, right? Because there is going to be a signal slot mechanism where I'm going to connect a function, and there's going to be a little pointer there to my view that's going to mutate it. So these circles of things, they don't really compose, right? Like when you have something that emits a signal and you would try to abstract it, it's hard. So when we add more and more controllers and more views, we get more arrows and more arrows, and we cannot get rid of them. We have to think of all of them when trying to understand the system, and we finally get the flying spaghetti code monster that takes over our code. So I would like to propose another architecture and I would like to start thinking in this architecture with this picture, because the first thing is that interactive software is not only about what happens in the computer. It's also about the person that uses it, right? So we have to start thinking that there is someone that has a mental model of the world, and we want to extend this mental model in some representation in the computer such that this person can achieve things enhance their abilities somehow through the computer. Now, the person is going to tell the computer to do things by doing actions and also telling the computer to do actions. It's action in this double sense, right? The person does something such that the computer does something. And finally, there are going to be views. The computer is going to represent its model in a way that is consumable by the person such that we can have this immediate feedback loop that makes using interactive software uh, so engaging. And these bubbles here, there could be something like values that then are related through transformations, right? So the person uses their will to transform their mental model of the world into an action. Then the computer is going to use some update mechanism to transform the action into a new state of the data model, then we're going to render this data model to obtain uh, a new view, and then we're going to uh, use perception right, to uh, absorb what the computer is telling us and react accordingly. So we have this feedback loop that is uh, relatively simple. Now, we can cut this drawing with some big scissors, and on the top part, 
we have more the social aspects of uh, software development, like UX design and soft, um, user research, etc., which are very important for our systems. And on the bottom part, we have what we are concerned with as programmers. So if we take the bottom part, we get this picture where we have action to model to view. This is called the unidirectional data flow architecture that is very popular on the web, so I didn't invent this myself. Uh, you can find many instances of this, for example, uh, in the uh, Facebook Flux uh, architecture uh, model, etc. And the nice thing about this data uh, sorry, about this <laughs> architecture is that first, the arrows go in only one direction. That's a wing already. But more importantly, the boxes, they are not objects. They are values. And the arrows, they are not references. They are functions. So I'm going to have an a function update that takes the current model, the action that happened, and return a new model. Then I'm going to have a render function that takes the model and returns a new view, values, right? Model values, action values, view values. Now, many of you know that to implement this render function efficiently, maybe you will need something like React.js. But you could also use an immediate mode API, an API that just draws on the screen. And there are C++ libraries like MGUI uh, for having GUI widgets, or the more low-level libraries like SDL or OpenGL they all have like an immediate aspect to it. Finally, we're going to need a way to dispatch actions, right? So we're going to need to be able to hook something in some event system from the operating system to translate the new the actions that are somehow related to the view um, into new actions. So I'm going to write uh, an example application in this way that I'm going to show you first. It's an interactive counter. Now, it's going to be, I think, very disappointing because it's very, oops. Um, it's very simple example, right? It's like uh, my first C++ program kind of example. So I have a counter. Current value is zero. And I have, uh, I can increment it by giving it the plus command, plus command, plus command, minus command decreases, and then I can use the dot command to reset it. It's interactive somehow, not a lot, but I think it's nice in the sense that um, since it's so simple, we can focus on the architectural aspects as opposed to, you know, what, the what we want to achieve with the application itself. So first step, data model, right? Here, it's very simple, just a value, an integer value. Second step, actions. As I said, I wanted to have them as values. Easiest way to have them as values, have types for the particular values. Uh, so I can have an increment action, a decrement action, and a reset action, where I give it also the parameter value to the value we want to reset it. In the example, actually, it always did it to zero, to the default value. Now, these types of actions, um, I have to combine them together such that I can have one single update function that dispatches to the right action. The nice tool that we have in C++17 to achieve this is variant. I can combine the different types of actions, and now I have one action type that can be either increment, decrement, or reset. Now I have enough information to write my update function. That is a pure function in the functional programming sense. It's very easy to test and just takes the action and the model. And the meat of it is visiting the action. Now, if you're not very familiar with variants, you might not understand the first line, std visits, lagger visitor. Lagger visitor is actually from a library from me. There is a better one uh, from Vittorio Romero. Uh, called Celta, I think. Um, it's tools for making the syntax for visiting variants easier. That doesn't matter. What you should focus on is on the fact that I have different functions that are going to be applied depending on what kind of action is contained in the visitor. And these functions, you know, they are 
as trivial as you could expect them, right? So if I, I got an increment action, I have to return a new model with the value incremented, decremented, or resetted to the value that was specified in the action. Now, this is also all, you know, independent for my view mechanism, right? I could write many ways, uh, many different UIs for this program. I'm going to write the one that I showed you before specifically. So to draw the, the data model, I'm going to just print it to the terminal. And then I'm going to also define a function that didn't appear in my architecture drawing. Some people put it there sometimes because it's interesting. It's what we call intent. And it's what a function also, a pure function, that maps an event, a low-level event, you could say, that contains information about what the user did physically, right? In this case, they press a character, so the event is just the character that the user inserted. And it's going to map it to the action in our application logic sense, right? This is why it's called intent, right? It's like, what, what do you intend to do when I click the mouse? This function is going to tell you. Now, finally, uh, the main function is going to just, you know, keep the state in a variable. This is the only mutating variable that we're going to have through our whole application. And then we're going to just read events, map them through the intent, update the state. And there is a typo in the slide. Uh, it should also read it, right? So there should be a call to draw just after update. You could say that it was a little bit overkill for such a small application, but you could imagine very simply how this can scale to bigger pro uh, programs because we just use plain data for the data model, which is composable, right? The structs are composable. You can put structs into other structs, and we just have pure functions for our updates and everything, which are also very composable. You can call functions inside functions. And it's going to be also very static, very easy to reason about, I believe. So when you want to do applications uh, in this way, sometimes you may want to use a framework. So if you're doing stuff for the web, there are many tools, actually, that you could use, uh, like Elm. Elm is a programming language uh, inspired by Haskell, but with a more simplified type system that really includes this architecture as a fundamental concept in the language, actually. There is also Redux, which is a library um, that is very often used in combination with React and Immutable.js <coughs> that uh, implements this architecture. And I'm presenting here today this still kind of work in progress library that I call Lago, which is uh, a Redux for C++, basically, in spirit. And that's the URL where you can get it. So if I wanted to do something a little bit more interactive, that is going to still be a terminal application, but you know I don't want to have to press enter and do commands. I want the application to react immediately. Since I want the application to react immediately, I probably want to have an event loop that is going to be listening to this asynchronous event and dispatching them. In this case, we're going to use Boost IO service as a main loop device. The library is actually agnostic from your UI framework or main loop technology. So there's an abstraction such that you can bind your main loop to that. In this case, we're going to just use Boost ASIO. And then the meat of the library is this make store function where I first have to tell it the kind of actions I want to dispatch in my application. I have to tell it the initial state. I have to tell it what the update function is, what the draw function is, and what's the main loop device that it can use to manage events. Now, uh, I have written this very thin wrapper of it in courses that allows me to have you know, a terminal object, as in terminal, the terminal I interact with, uh, where I can listen for events, and then I can map them through uh, this an intent function and dispatch actions to the store. Right? Then the store is going to manage calling the update function, managing some state, and managing calling redraws. Finally, we call server run. Um, the nice thing is that once we give the store control for our main loop, 
we can uh, use tools that this library provides us to extend the application without changing uh, our fundamental mechanisms. One thing we might want to do is to have what is very often called a time-traveling debugger or a time-traveling dev tool. Because since I modeled my application using values, nothing stops us from, for example, keeping a history of all the values of the application <coughs> and seeing what they are, or even moving the whole state of the application back to a previous state. Why not? The library can take care of this for you. So if you instantiate the debugger here, and then you pass, this is called uh, an enhancer. I didn't invent the term, that's from Redux, um, that tells the store to use this debug server. So I can go here, and I can use a counter um, Counter end courses. I'm going to use the meta version. So this is, you know, the application. It's a bit more interactive than before. Oops. What did I do? No. Um, and I can now uh, go to localhost 8080 and the application itself is serving me this interface to control it. So the first thing I can do is to see all the states of the application. So I can go back to the first state, initial model, value was zero, and I can start going down and say, okay, the first thing that I did was to increment, and I got a new model, one, and I can inspect all the states of the application. But even further, I can actually double click here and bring the application back to that state. I can then go back to the application and use it, uh, sorry, I didn't, yeah, and continue using it from that state, right? Um, so what is that? Oh, it's 33, but I think it's like, a, it's an update problem from end courses. Like it's not removing the, the second thing, right? Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, th this is a very powerful tool. Now, how is this built? Well, this is built using the same mechanism that we had for describing models and actions. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to grab the action type, which is here as this template argument, and the model type in my of my application, and enhance it with the time travel capabilities. So first I need to define my actions where I have now just the go to action that could move me to a different state. I had the undo and redo. Um, and finally, I combine it into a variant. In the variant, I put the action type of the application itself because the application can send an action and I have to deliver it right to the underlying application. So every action that happens that do this patch in the store is going to go first through the debugger, and then the debugger is going to deliver it to the application. We're going to see how. Um, then I can define the data model, and the data model is going to have the initial state when you construct it, and then it's going to have the cursor position of where I am in the history, and then just a history with everything that happened in the application so far. What happened? It has to keep what actions happen and what were the resulting model after applying these actions. Now, it's not an STD vector. It's an Emer vector. It's from a library that I wrote that has immutable uh, data structures that help you cope with the problem of copying these vectors too often. Now, I also provide conversion from the model of the application and to the model of the application, right? The conversion to the model of the application is just returning the model at the current position in the history. Now, finally, we need to define the update function, which is very similar to the other update functions, but it has one parameter more. It takes what was the update function of the underlying application, right? Why? If we get an action from the application, we just call the reducer of the application to generate the new state using 
the logic from the underlying application. Otherwise, oh, sorry. Otherwise, you know, we have other actions that each of them is actually two lines of code, but I don't want to overwhelm you uh, with code. You can just, you know, imagine yourself how they would look like. It's just playing with the cursor position mostly. Um, now, this is nice, right? So this means that basically when I do make store here, the store is going to be actually a store of debuggers of actions and models. This is a composable system. I can instantiate another debugger, compose it with the other debugger. I'm going to call this the meta debugger. This composition here is just function composition, so enhancers, like store enhancers, they're just functions, so you can compose them easily. And now I can debug the debugger. Yes? Sorry? Server, uh, yes, you're right. Uh, so the question was, uh, shouldn't it be debug instead of server uh, in the enable debug line? And that's correct. This um, should be debug, which is this object here, as opposed to you know the IO service. So now I can go back to. Uh, to, to, to here, uh, I'm going to actually go back and do some actions. So uh, make, actually I'm going to restart it because it's annoying this in courses back. Uh, OK, so I have here the normal debugger. And now I'm like, OK, I want to see what's happening in the debugger's head. So I can go to the other port. I'm going to detach this. And I can see I have actually six states because the other debugger executed six actions, or we have executed six things in total from the beginning. And while I here see this is the decrement action and this value, here I see, well, I got an action, which was an action of the application that may contain an increment, blah, blah. And the particular action in that action, <laughs> in that variant, is the decrement action. OK. And now I can also see all the states of the application as one single value, right? So I can do crazy things now, actually. So I can undo here. I'm going to use control set a couple of, of times. And what I see is that while here I'm undoing, here I'm adding new states, right? Because from the point of view of the debugger, the debugger is in a new state after it undid. Make sense? It's, gonna, it's getting a bit crazy, right? So I can then go back and undo the undo, which brings the program forward, which is a bit crazy, but <laughs> this is how it is, right? Uh, now, we're like, OK, this is a composable system. So we can debug the debugger. Why don't we debug the debugger for the debugger? And now it's like, what's going to happen here? It's like, I, I'm going to see the program before it was compiled or something? I don't know. Let's see. Meta, meta. Oh my god. What's fucking going on? I don't think it's broken. Oh my god. Hello. This is an SOS message. This message is being recorded in the year 2047 <laughs> and is being sent through a time traveling meta meta debugger to software developers in the year 2017. My name is Commander Hans Peter Bolivarnov. I am head of the human resistance in Berlin and I have two important messages for you the good news and the bad news. The good news is the Berlin Brandenburg Airport was finally inaugurated last year. <laughs> to go on, but it sure is a nice airport. <laughs> the bad news is, well, you can see for yourself. Over the last three decades, object fetishist programmers all around the world continue to write software using shared mutable states. By the year 2037, 
99% of the existing code had no one alive that could ever understand it. Five years later, the European Federation tried to pass a new ruling banning the use of reference semantics, but lobbies of Java consulting corporations stopped it. What no one knew is that meanwhile, all this mutating, inscrutable code was becoming conscious of itself. When the new military software network Bolognese Net was connected two years later, the spaghetti code monster was unleashed. And it took over all computer guided weapons, declaring open war against humanity. Please, developers from the past, the future is in your hands. Stop using shared mutable states. What is this? Oh, no. No! <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm gonna do something to clean up this computer. <laughs> it's getting dangerous here. Okay, sorry about that interruption. Um, so <laughs> I think this is a good point to put some closure. Um, first of all, I want to introduce just some topics that you might want to look at afterwards. Um, one is effects. I've been talking about pure functions all the time, but my programs might want to do things beyond just being drawn. And some of this stuff might be need to be decided in the update function. So there are different ways to do it. I chose in the library the way it works in Elm, which is allowing the update function to return a function that could apply effects. So this is not going to be evaluated immediately, but it's going to be delayed such that this function is still pure, but you can describe effects. This is one way to do it, there are other ways. The second topic that is important is, okay, what about doing an application is big and that uses a lot of data? Then you're gonna need, you're gonna need smart data structures for that. Uh, so I built actually a text editor using this approach. It's actually using this library now, if you've seen other versions of it that didn't, um, that you know it can handle, handle files actually that are bigger than a gigabyte and still use this model. And it also supports the time traveling debugger and all this stuff. So uh, if you want to learn more about these data structures, there is a talk from CPPCon this year uh, that I did on immutable data structures that you can see afterwards if you're interested. Another thing is, OK, I was always talking about snapshots, snapshots of the state. What happens if? I have more asynchronous things that are important to my applications that are not so easy to describe as a snapshots. I can go back to this notion of, I can describe the value of the whole lifetime of a thing somehow. And there is a tool for that, which is RxCPP. It's a very nice library uh, from Kirk Shoup that did also a very nice talk at CPP now this year uh, called No Raw Thread, where he builds actually an interactive application with lots of, you know, um, concurrent and asynchronous streams of things. Um, again, getting back to the conclusion, I think the values are most valuable when we think in architectural terms, in, in terms of values, and then use objects for the details. Uh, I hope uh, this inspired you somehow to try these ideas out in your programs. Uh, here are the links to uh, the different tools I've been presenting. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you. Do we have time for questions or? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, so if there are any questions, you can walk to the microphones or, yeah.
Yeah, so I tried something very similar just a few days ago. And um, one thing I, I struggled with is um, doing kind of the meta information on the model or the state, if mm -hmm. you'd use Redux uh, speak for this. But you seem to have this figured out because you, because you had the JSON in your debugger. So how did you do it? <laughs> oh, how I do the JSON part, yeah. yeah <laughs> I didn't yeah, show yeah. that other change. So I used a uh, serialization library. So you have to tell the system how to serialize your objects to be able okay. to show uh, JSON. Um, I actually have some macros that make it very simple for structs and make it automatic for variants and for some of the uh, and for vectors and all this stuff. So uh, it's not hard. You could use a different way of serializing things. But I mean, serialization is also a pure function, so that should be uh, fine. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, kind of. It was like it's kind of the introspection part of that because you have to walk the data structure to serialize it and. It duplicates some of the structure, sadly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I, I agree it would be awesome if C++ actually had proper compile time reflection so you could do all that really automatically. Yeah, right? that's and like the last missing piece of the puzzle. Then. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally. But in the meantime, you know, you have to be explicit. Uh, that's how it is. It's not too bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank Thanks. You. Great talk. Thanks. Uh, yeah, hi. Thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering, the actions that you presented are very, all very discrete, and like I'm making games, so the actions there are often take place over time, mm -hmm. and breaking them down to like single actions could work, but that would mean a lot of very small single actions that don't really have meaning on their own. Yeah. So do you see a way to adapt what you were presenting to? like having actions that don't all happen at the same time, but still kind of belong together? I think that's a space where really uh, the reactive approach that I very briefly mentioned at the end would be useful, right? Because um, that allows you to describe a sequence of things as a single value, as opposed to just a single thing. I mean, you can still use this approach, but as you say, it can be sometimes a bit more messy because you're going to have separate actions and you have to think that, oh, which action leads to the other action afterwards. So it gets into a stateful thinking a little bit if you have this kind of, yeah, sequence of uh, actions somehow. There is also this notion, if you look into Redux, the JavaScript framework, they have this notion of saga, which is something like a half a transaction that is composed of a smaller transactions. Um, and this might be a useful place to, to research as well, if you want to find abstractions to deal with that. Thank you. Any other? No. So thank you very much again. Uh, see you around. <laughs>